Hello, and welcome to the Science Fiction and Fantasy Marketing Podcast, the show where we help you establish your author brand, increase the size of your audience, and sell more books. I'm Lindsay Baroker, and I'm here with my two co-hosts. I'm Jeff Poole. And I'm Joe Lalo. And we've got a cool guest for you here this week, Joseph Malik. He's sold 10,000 copies of his first fantasy novel. So we're going to be asking him about the story and uh, about how he sold things. Uh, it's called The Dra Dragon's Trail is the first book. And he's just published a second one in the Outworlders fantasy series. That's called New Magic. And when he's not publishing fiction, Amazon tells me, he writes and lectures on advanced intelligence theory and asymmetric warfare for the US military. He's worked as a stuntman, a high rise window washer, a computational linguist, a touring rock museum, and a soldier in the United States Special Operations Command. He's been a long musician. time. Musician, you said museum. What did I say? Museum. <laughs> Museum. I thought I was doing so good. No, that's all. You were doing great. Oh, God, man. You made me okay. sound awesome. Can you do it again? <laughs> it will only get worse as the night goes on. Yes. He has also lectured okay. on writing fantasy, and uh, he's into speaking as an expert in swordsmanship and hand-to-hand -hand combat. So maybe he'll give us a few tips while he's here. Since uh, I am uh, not doing the best at the intro, even though I was proud of myself for getting through most of it. <laughs> Joseph, or Joe, I guess you'd like to be called. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into writing fantasy? Yeah, hey, sure. Um, Lindsay actually got most of it. <laughs> I started writing fantasy, I started writing fantasy back when I was in high school, and I was reading a lot of fantasy, and I guess now you'd call it young adult fantasy um, back then, and I was noticing a lot of technical errors in it. And this was back in the 80s. So this was like the Dragonlance era, that that kind of thing. And I don't want to call any authors out specifically, but um but yeah, just a lot of things that even even I as a kid knew that some of these things that the author was talking about just weren't right. And I'm not talking about the magic. I'm talking about the actual nuts and bolts of the way the world went went together. I was reading this book and you're probably gonna know this one by this scene if you're really into really into that, that generation of fantasy, but there was a scene where all these adventurers are sitting around a fire at night and they're making stew because adventurers always do. And don't even get me started on that, but they're sitting around this fire and one of the characters looks through the fire at night and sees somebody coming from the other side of the fire. And I'd sat around enough campfires as a kid that I knew that you can't look through a fire and see the other side. I didn't know why, but I knew you couldn't. When you have a light, you can't see from a lit area into a dark one. Human beings can't do that. And I went to the research library, and this was before the internet. I went to the research librarian and asked her, why, you know, why, why, why can't you do this? Why, is it, why can't we see from a lit area into a dark one? Right? Why do I have to turn off the lights inside my house to look outside at night? And she came back with this great answer, like at the end of the day or something, about how the rods and cones in our eyes are built and how – and it turns out that dogs can see from a lit area into a dark one, but human beings can't. And that there was a theory at the time that that's one of the reasons that dogs are our companions uh, was that they could see things coming through the fire. But anyway, this person couldn't. And I was like, God, why did, how did the author get that wrong? Like, that's so simple. I mean, if they, if they never sat around a campfire and I didn't know this at the time, I, I didn't, I didn't know that most authors didn't do these kinds of things that I then embarked on. So I started taking fencing classes at the local community college and, um, and then in college, I fenced and uh, I used to box. And um, one thing kind of led to another. I spent a year or so in the Society for Creative Anachronism. And then I started getting into um, uh, ancient manuals of, of uh, ancient manuals of arms for rapier fencing and armored combat and uh, martial arts. And then I got into stunt work. And just and it turned into this whole. I wanted to do for Knights in Armor what Tom Clancy did for the nuclear submarine. I wanted to write a, a fantasy series that got the mundane details correct. And as I went on and learned more and more about writing and really started getting into fantasy and really complex fantasies, one of the things that I noticed was that if you are going to I want to say this, in order to suspend disbelief sufficiently to introduce the magical elements in a fantasy novel, especially for an, for an adult readership, then you first have to suspend disbelief in the mundane. And adult readers know, they know a lot 
And I found this going to fantasy conventions that there are a lot of readers who know a lot of stuff. A lot of readers own swords. A lot of readers do their own research. A lot of them, I mean, readers have very strange hobbies and they're really into the arcana of things. And you'll throw them right out of the story if you if you miss these little points. Um, and so I decided that that was kind of the market that I wanted to shoot for because I wasn't seeing anybody writing fantasy for these uh, for these readers, historical fantasy, yes, but not like a portal fantasy and not a not 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 a real blood and guts kind of uh, portal fantasy. So, yeah, and that that whole thing, that entire experience, I probably spent ten years just doing research hands on. I mean, I studied blacksmithing and learned how to ride a horse and uh, learned how to make steel out of iron and charcoal and went mountaineering and did all kinds of things. So. Pretty much if my characters do it in the book, I've probably done it or something close to it in real life at this point. So That's um, awesome. Yeah. You made me think yeah, back up with the, the Stu comment because I've, you've probably read it. Uh, Diana Wynne-Jones has a book called The Tough Guide to Fantasyland. It's probably 20, 30 years yes, old. Yes, I love it. Yes. <laughs> it's yeah, hilarious. Yeah. Everybody should yep. check it out. She was bashing like stew you know it takes five hours to make and yet everybody's always eating it around the campfire after that's what i was going to get it yeah exactly exactly yeah it takes forever you don't you don't you don't you just don't know you things you just don't do but yeah um that's exactly right it takes hours and hours to make stew um and i guess so i tried the traditional route uh for a very long time probably 15 years or so. I mean, I wrote my first book when I was in high school and it, it was, it was terrible. I still actually still have it. Um, it's actually right over here in a trunk and it's, uh, you have the actual original, um, typewritten manuscript. And I think I've actually posted it, put pictures of it on keyboards before. Um, and it's, it's, it's terrible and, and it, it, it deserved to be buried in a trunk someplace. But, and the next several books that I wrote, were also terrible. And I kept trying to get them published and I kept getting turned down again and again and again. And then finally, um, I just, I just quit. I don't know, maybe 10 years ago, I just gave up completely and I forgot all about it. Um, it was just writing was just a thing that I tried, you know, and I just gave up on it. And then I was injured in operation enduring freedom. Um, in 2012 and ended up in the hospital for a long time my wife sent me a, a hard drive that had some uh movies and music and some other stuff on it and on that old hard drive was a was uh this file folder that had the last manuscript on it that i'd worked on and i read it and it was terrible but i had all of this unstructured time i had nothing to do and i, mean, I was in a freaking wheelchair for months i had nothing to do um and so i just started writing again and uh, that book turned into Dragon's Trail eventually. And then I tried to get it published again traditionally, got turned down several more times, and then finally started my own publishing company and released it uh, on my own in 20, late 2016. And it's, it's done really well. So, it know. sounds like you, you have taken the very most thorough approach to virtually everything that could be involved in writing, which is impressive. I also started writing in high school, and my first novel stunk, but I published it. It's, it's also in a box. <laughs> Uh, yeah, baby. It's a different <laughs> world. It's a it's a different world. It it just it just it, yeah. It's. But uh, now you, we we talked a lot about how you know it it grinds your gears to see people messing up on the finer elements of things that you could have actually experienced that are in a it fantasy novel. You know, it doesn't so much anymore. It used to. It really used to. And um, unless it's a real clunker, uh, then I I just roll with it because I didn't know until I started meeting other authors, I didn't know that other authors didn't do this. I honestly thought that, you know, learning how to sword fight and repelling off cliffs was just what you did after you got an English degree. I just thought this is where fantasy authors came from. This is what everybody did. And I was blown away and I still am. I get these just startled and sometimes even strident responses from other authors when I explain my process. Um, and I just didn't, Honestly, and now that I know that, I I cut everybody a lot more slack. I honestly didn't didn't cross my mind that other people didn't do this. So uh, I don't know. Well, 
No, well, but it, it's fair to say that if you take the time to get things right, it produces an overall higher quality for the book and, and builds a better world. So like at what level do you think that people should start making sure like there's going to be a point where you go from reality to fantasy and at what Absolutely. point should that be? Like how, how much groundwork do you think an author should do to really get the best benefit for adding in realism and, and stuff? I think they should do as much as possible always, but it doesn't all have to go in the book. Um, and the, the, the phrase that I use is that people will believe in flying horses if the saddles make sense. Absolutely. And that's really what it comes down to. You know, I mean, um, that's, that's it. You know, it takes magic to make the horses fly, but how are you going to get a guy in a saddle with the wings are where his legs are? And then how's he going to control a horse in an uncontrolled negative G, in a negative G dive with his legs flying up behind him? What's going to happen then? If you belt him to the saddle, what's going to happen if somebody hits him with a lance? And if you ever saw the, if you ever saw the soccer ball cannon episode of Mythbusters, um, and or if you have or if you have a background in 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 mathematics or vector physics, uh, you know, a bird flies at sometimes at the same speed as an arrow out of a hunting weight bow. So if you fire an arrow off the back of one of these horses, flying horses, it that speed is going to stay perfectly still, and you're going to have to hope somebody runs into it. It would be impossible to do uh, to do mounted. Uh, com to do mounted missile combat. So it just goes around and around. I mean, how do you do this? How do you solve those problems? And then once you, once you, when you, if you, if you concentrate on those problems and you drill down, you, you solve those in a, in a creative way, they're not going to ask about the horses. They're not going to ask about the horses because the saddles are so cool. Exactly. So, I, I kind of want to write a story now where there's a person who understands the metaphysics, but doesn't understand the physics. And so he can't get things to work. Oh no! Well, that's a huge thing in this whole series. The the series are they're fantasy techno thrillers, and the one of the undercurrents of the series is retaining human agency in the face of a looming technological disaster. These guys go over into this other world, and they take modern high speed steel with them, and modern martial arts training, and education, and all of the things that we have going for us that they simply wouldn't in this world. Listen to sort of medieval stasis and it starts an arms race and they have things that they understand that other people just simply don't. I mean, there's, there's a scene in the second book where the main character is using celestial navigation to, to find their way during this really long eclipse because they're on this little tiny moon circling this gigantic ring planet. And so they go into this period of eclipse for six days and it's completely dark. You can't, and it's just absolutely dark. Um, so the, and there are, there's there are no references and nothing comes up and nothing I mean the, the sun doesn't come up for you know six days and they're out in the middle of the wilderness and but he watches the stars come up and so long they go up in the east they go down in the west so if the stars are going this way then I know I'm facing that direction and he tries to explain this to them and he tries again and again and again and finally they just take his word for it when they end up where they were going um, but it's the thing you know Boy Scouts learn this stuff in our world but these people just never so yeah right there with you they're they're stuck. <laughs> So, yeah. I have a question about your sword fighting. You mentioned you took up fencing, which means you were obviously practicing with the rapier. You hinted at a few others. Which other weapons did you practice on with the swords? Well, I sword or, uh, like a katana yeah, or anything no like that? Or? Sure. Um, I started off with foil. Uh, the way everybody does, I guess. Um, and then I found an old cavalry saber at an antique store when I was still in high school. Um, and my instructor showed me some saber techniques. I, th I liked saber a lot more. It's much more aggressive. Um, and I'm not, I'm not very tall. I'm about five feet nine. So I'm, I'm built like a saber fencer. I've got a big chest and long arms. So, um, yeah, so saber was really fun. And then I went from saber into rapier. Um, and it's mostly been European stuff so um rapier i liked a lot i've got a background in judo and boxing so a lot of the armored techniques um work really really well uh really had took a liking to fiore um and some of his armored combat techniques which are almost exactly no gi judo throws um and a lot of the striking techniques are, are very similar and then just a few years ago i got into great sword 
um, which I just absolutely love. So the, the not the big Zwiehander two-handed swords, but the, the Great Sword of War, which is about a four foot long sword that's got about a foot of handle and you can do quite a bit of quite a bit with it um i'm not i'm getting a little long in the tooth so i don't do long sword it's just a little too uh way too much crash and bash for me i just i can't i can't take that kind of punishment anymore or i can't i just don't want to I'm too old for that crap so do you still practice with them i do i and do if so how do you manage to practice without the cops being called on you actually i've had the cops called on me um <laughs> I'm not that I'm laughing because I was curious. I've, no, also I, taken, I've also taken Taekwondo, got almost to my black belt, and I had to move. But uh, we practice with the katanas and what like what not there. And and I'm sure. six three, and my instructor was like five seven. He just looked at me, and I was like, "This is gonna be easy." Well, when you're that big in martial arts, you become the guinea pig. He goes, "Let me show oh, you yeah. how to take down a big guy." I'm like, "Crap!" And I have, I was on the mat so many times it wasn't even funny there. But I was just kind of wondering how you handle when you want to practice. You know, just, do you have like a like your own like a training gym you go to or uh, no i've got I've, i have a big backyard and i have a big backyard and i've got some friends who do it so um so it all just kind of works out i mean it oh, one of the great things about having done a lot of this stuff myself and having done a lot of my research firsthand is that i've made lifelong friends who do this stuff so i've got sword guys i can call when i want to work something out i've got judo guys that i can get together with and work things out and you have a beer and you just work some things out and we're all getting older so we don't go full speed or anything but hey i've got an idea on how to do this can you come over for a minute and we'll just, you know, spend the afternoon let's roll around okay cool um you know and also i'm in the army so we have we have gyms everybody in the army does combatives which is effectively jujitsu so it's always always easy to find somebody to roll with and in fact i take a mouth guard with me to work because he just you know, he just he, you know. we, we have a pair of boxing gloves at work we call them the problem solvers so um yeah, it's uh, so yeah, it's it's. Yeah, but we did actually. A friend of mine and I were out in the backyard uh, with great swords and blunt ones, mind you. And um, and yeah, we were out there. And one of the neighbors called the police because he didn't know what the hell was going on. And um, yeah, the sheriff came over and we had a nice long talk. Let, let me ask you real quick: Did you ever teach any of your spouse or significant other any of these like a jujitsu ju 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 moves or anything like that? Because I made the mistake in Taekwondo. Our instructor taught us Hapkido, how the art of breaking grips. I made the mistake the of showing escape, my yeah. wife, and that was the biggest freaking mistake I've ever made. Because anytime I try to take her arms, she like makes a little move and snaps out of it. I'm like, damn it! <laughs> uh, well, I don't have to show my wife much. Um, my wife is an extremely capable woman. Uh, there is one thing actually very funny though, cause my wife, uh, is, she's a professional opera singer and there's, there was a moment on stage a few years ago. I don't remember the name of the, oh, I should know this. I don't remember the name of the opera now. It'll come to me in a minute, but there was a scene in the, in the opera where her character had to, she had to arrest, um, she had to arrest this guy. And uh, the the one one of the one of the tenors, I think. Anyway, and um, and I showed her how uh, she went up to him and put her hand out to shake his hand, and she and he shook her hand, and she put her other hand on his, and then turned right around and threw a hammer lock on him and marched him off the stage. And I showed her how to do that, and every time she did that, the entire audience just went like just completely bonkers. Uh, and uh, yeah, yeah, she's she's. She's she's pretty cool. She hadn't seen that one before, but um, do you but have yeah, any was, recommendations <laughs> for um, let's say fantasy authors out there? Are maybe a mom of three or something. They're probably not going to go grab up some great swords, um, but maybe something not. they could try. Like I I know I just dabbled in stuff, but I found what I liked about fencing was that you really got into it quickly and you were actually yes. on the strip and practicing the stuff. Absolutely. Versus like exactly. karate where you do two years of like jab punch jab punch, you know, and no, not no, you definitely. Know, like there's more fact, um, go ahead there's a huge resurgence right now in historical european martial arts and in fact in most cities you can if you do a little bit of poking around online you can usually find i mean i'm i'm, in, I'm outside tacoma washington and there are i think there are now two fencing historical fencing clubs in tacoma of all places um, i think there's another one down in olympia now um and uh so yeah, it's, it is, it is completely doable and they do rapier and they do long sword 
Um, and uh, there are also fencing schools all over the place. Foil is very light contact, very fast, um, keeps the eye sharp. It's not tremendously physically demanding, but you understand, gives you some idea of what swords do and what they don't do and how kind of how they work. And, and there's, it's so neat to be able to write a fight scene experientially when you've actually had people coming at you full speed. You know what it, you know what it looks like. You know what it feels like. You know what it sounds like inside the helmet. And I know that you can make that stuff up. I know you can. You can imagine all those things. And you can make it, it you know, in, 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 and, and imagination is a great part of being an author. But I'm, I'm not a terribly imaginative person. And that's one of the reasons that I did it this way is that I, it was literally easier for me in some cases to go out and do these things myself than to sit down and try to figure out what it would be like to do it. Um, some people can do that. I, I can't, there's, there's like a gene missing or something. I don't know, but I'm not, a, um, yeah. So yeah, I don't know. Um, but yeah, if you can sport fencing, you can get into it at any age. It's a wonderful sport. So much fun. Um, YMCA's generally teach, um, you know, self-defense classes or even, uh, yeah, um, in fact, there's a hot keto class right here at a YMCA um, that the that, that they're doing. Um, yeah, it's all just all kinds of things that you can do. You just have to kind of poke around, I guess. Um, okay, does great. That help? And you mentioned too that you kind of consider yourself like a Tom Clancy type of fantasy writer, and I, I find that when mm -hmm. for some readers they don't want that much technical detail and they might get bogged oh, no. down a little bit. Do you? Yep. Just not target those folks, or do you? really consciously try to keep the pace going? Well, keeping the pace going is up to my editor. Um, it's her job to call me on my bullshit. Um, so, and, and she does, and she's great. Uh, she trims a lot of that stuff out. But something that's been fantastic has actually, and I gotta be very careful about how I say this, because um, I've been getting more and more as the numbers of reviews on my book have gone up, as the sales have gone up, I've been getting more and more negative reviews specifically about the amount of detail in the book. Uh, in the first one, and I'm seeing this now in the second one. And at first, I was really bummed about this. I thought, God, maybe I should change my whole approach. Maybe I shouldn't be doing it this way. And then my wife pointed out that those reviews mean that the book is finally loose in the wild and it's getting away from the people that we originally targeted. And now it's finding a wider audience and you're going to get more of these, especially when you're writing something that's as specific as what is, as what you're writing. So now I see those reviews from people who don't like what I'm doing and that's totally fine because I'm not writing for them. I mean, when it comes down to it, I'm writing for me and I'm writing for the handful of people that I, that I know who like the kinds of things that I like. That's what I'm writing for. Uh, just so happens that, that market was way larger than anybody I think ever gave it credit for. So there's always more people out there than you expect. And talking about the uh, the uh, uh, bad reviews once they start showing up, my Uncle Bob, who is not a writer, but was, he did work in customer service for 25 years, had the statistic that people are nine times more likely to complain about something than to compliment something. So if your ratio is nine, is nine times, isn't nine to one bad, then you're doing very well. That is outstanding. That is, yeah, that's, those, are, that's, those are good numbers, man. Hang on one second. Right Completely on. tied up. Hey. Good Lord. There we go. Our, our listeners don't know this, but I had warned beforehand that my headphones were tangled up as well. Uh, all right. So while, uh, while you were getting yourself yeah. configured there, uh, you are self-published, uh, but you I have know. had what, what many would call a traditional release schedule and that it, it was two years between your books. Uh, was, in the yeah. two years since the last release, roughly, uh, how much time was spent prepping and writing the book? Like, was it a two year development cycle or did you at some point during that time start writing? I spent about the first six months after the release of Dragon's Trail just trying to figure out what the hell I was doing um, and just trying to get a handle on marketing and trying to, I mean, obviously I'm still, still trying to get a handle on marketing, but trying to figure out what worked and what didn't. And I got pulled in a bunch of different directions at first and it actually worked out really well because I found out a lot of things that didn't work for me that seemed to work really well for other people. And that's all fine too. Um, so yeah, I spent about six months of trial and error. And then the actual writing process was, yeah, probably about a year, I think maybe nine or 10 months of really hard writing 
And then I had about three months of developmental editing and the final little fiddling and then multiple proofreading passes and then artwork and all of that. So yeah, yeah, I could, I, I'm hoping to get the second, the third one out the next one, <laughs> hoping to get the third one out inside 18 months. And I'm about a third of the way through the first draft now, but I have a terrible, terrible writing process. So it takes me a long time. So. <laughs> you mentioned your various ventures, like, you know, stuntman, rock musician, being a soldier, mm -hmm. were to help you write your story and try and envision you know, what your characters are going through. Which of those do you think help the most? Which of those like, ventures? Definitely being a soldier, without a doubt, without a doubt. And those weren't things that I actually did. I didn't take up those careers uh, as a way of doing research for the book it just kind of just kind of happened that way um these were things that i found myself drawn to because of the research that i did i found that i was really good at things um especially when i was younger i had a, i had tremendous physical gifts um and uh and i don't i don't scare easy so um i just i'm not i'm not afraid of heights i'm not particularly afraid of spiders i'm fine with enclosed spaces there are just things that just don't seem to bother me as much as they bother other people. And so I was able to, I was able to do some really fun things. Um, but definitely being a soldier without a doubt. And I thought, because I joined the military fairly late in life. Uh, and I was originally trying to write this as a military fantasy. And I thought that I could read enough military fantasy to really get a handle on what it was like to be a soldier and what soldiers were like and really capture their voices and really capture, you know, what was going on and going through their minds and all these things. And what I was capturing were other authors' ideas of what that was like, which was totally fine. But as a soldier, now I realize I can go back and look at that stuff and I just wince because it's just, just horrifically wrong. And I can... There are definitely pieces of soldiers that I've that I've known who, uh, and these pieces show up as kind of in these amalgamations in, in, in these characters that I have now. So, um, yeah, it's definitely been the best thing. And seeing the, yeah, the machine, just see, just being part of the machine. There's just there's nothing like it. There's there's nothing. There's nothing to compare it to. And not that it's a great thing. It's not there's but there's just once you've seen once you've seen what people can accomplish once they have be I want to say this. Once you have given up enough of yourself to allow yourself to become part of a larger whole, um there's a what you can accomplish is just astonishing. And I think that that's something that, that soldiers today would share with soldiers all the way back as far as, as far back as, as, as you, as you want to go. I think if you could find a way to, to break the language barrier, to cross the language barrier, I bet that you could take, I mean, you could take a Roman soldier and you could sit him down with a modern day army ranger over beers. And if they, you could find a way for them to communicate in a half an hour, they'd be toasting absent friends and they'd have the same problems with logistics and supply and asshole officers and idiot underlings and stuff not working. And that time we were marching and the, the heel of my boot broke off or my sandal broke and I had to march for, you know, whatever, all these things and just all these little things. And I, I think they're constants throughout human history. And so there's, there's that sense of being part of something larger than yourself that, that, that I bring from the military side of it. And I just, I really think that that has to be experienced. It's, it, it transcends words. I don't know if I'll ever be able to capture it. So, I can uh, see where that'd be yeah. very useful, especially in epic fantasy where you're often self, it's a self-sacrificing and you do have to be part of like this bigger thing in order to take the ring, the Mount Doom, or, you know, to vanquish the great evil or whatever it is. It was definitely that. And there are also, you know, object lessons as well. I mean, one of the things that I study in the military now is um, we study intractable conflicts, which are wars that have been stalemated for so long that they've become generational. And one of the things that I 
that we look at and that one of the teams that I work with, things we look at is we look at these small wars around the world that are just kind of quietly simmering in these little backwaters nobody knows anything about. And it could just be a, you know, a, a valley in Africa with two tribes that have been at war for 75 years. And you, and we assess these conflicts and try to look for key factors that will uh, that'll tip it and start, start the, the war over again, right? So we, we, we look for these indicators. And that's been really fun as well because I, in building this world, I'm pointing to the map up here on the wall, um, but in building this world, the way that I did where everything works and all the way from the, I mean, from, 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 from the phases of the moon to the slivers and the floor, everything works and it all interconnects. So everything impacts everything else. When I did that, I realized that all I had to do was then rebuild the sociocultural factors that lead to intractability, and then I can destabilize them at will, which is something I'm not allowed to do in my job at all, because it turns out that intentionally destabilizing an intractable conflict by introducing advanced weaponry is a really good way to end up testifying in front of Congress. So um, we're, we're just not allowed to do that. It's not, it's not the 60s anymore. So, um, but all joking aside, it is kind of cool because this whole thing became a sandbox for some of my theories on, on the, one of the things that I study in the military. So I bring that practical aspect of it uh, over as well, I guess. And that, again, goes back to world building and having it all as real as I can get. Yeah, we were just in the chat thinking the prime directive from Star Trek there. Oh, it's true. We can't do that. A lot of stuff <laughs> we're not allowed to do. But the series itself is actually uh, an, an arms race. And so the first book, these guys from Earth go over to this other world and they kind of romp through it. And it's, it's, it's very fun and it's definitely not lighthearted, but it's funny. And they're being smart asses the whole time. And I had a reviewer who said that the main character is a cross between Jon Snow and Deadpool, which I just loved to death. So it's got that really kind of funny uh, undercurrent the whole time. And the second book gets a lot darker, darker because in the second book, the people that he angered in the first book go back to Earth and find somebody who can kill him. And he comes over with all the same advantages that these guys had the first time around. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, and, and the whole thing turns into this arms race. And the, when I talk about the new magic, the new magic is this, these, these, these weapons, this high-speed steel that they, that, they, that they come back with, the spring-tempered steel as opposed to the, the iron and the pig iron that they make their uh, armor out of. So, yeah. Um, All right. Well, that so sounds, that well, it's been really interesting talking about that. I appreciate you sharing your background and how it's helped you with your stories. We're going to swing towards the marketing side of things for those who want to know. Let's do that. Cause that's probably, <laughs> I, think that, I think that was why I was here, isn't it? Yeah, good right. Morning. We're uh, cause you can, you can cut mentioned. a bunch of this out. Yeah. <laughs> you've got a uh, only, I won't say only you published one book two years ago and just done the second mm -hmm. one. And so you're definitely not doing like the rapid release thing that, that some prolific indie authors are doing, but you've sold 10,000 copies of that first book. So why don't you tell us a little bit about like how the launch went of book one and, and what you learned and what really helped move some copies? Sure. Uh, the launch of book one was nothing to scream about. I was really happy because I, one of the things with the first book was I had, I sold, I think, I think my pre-sales were like 22 books. Uh, and I was ecstatic because like half of those um, and a good chunk of the sales for the first month I released in September on September 30th. And so a good chunk of my sales uh, for the month were, uh, were paper copies. And I was thrilled. I was like, this is great. Fantastic. Paper copies this is wonderful. And it turned out that it was all friends and family and they threw like a signing event for me for my birthday. And it was, so it was great. It was really cool. Um, but it also was a little bit heartbreaking cause damn. Um, and then it just kind of simmered. It didn't really do much. And I did pretty much, I guess what everybody does. I mean, I don't want to really mention any names, but I did, you know, I used like Fiverr gigs and I used some of the, 
some of the paid promotion services or you, you know, pay, you know, 30 bucks here, 40 bucks there. And they, and you drop your book to 99 cents. And I think I originally started at two ninety nine. Um, and I dropped the book to 99 cents and I did a blog tour and didn't really get much out of that. got a, I got one really great review out of it. Um, that was, was just wonderful and actually made some really good friends out of some of the bloggers. Um, and it became some of my early Goodreads friends. And now we follow each other on Twitter and we got bumped into some of them at conventions and things. And now it's, that part was awesome. That was great for sales. It didn't do so much, but laying that groundwork, uh, that's all great, but it didn't, you know, I was, I don't know, it's all in a book every couple of days, maybe for months. And, uh, with the occasional run up when I would uh, book one of these promotions. So that went for about six months. And I took all of the money that the book made and put it back into promotion every month. And then I kept very careful records of which promotions, you know, which ones worked, which ones didn't, how many I sold for each one. And every, at the end of every month, you know, I might make a hundred bucks. I might make 200 bucks, put it all back into promotion the next month. And I was finding that every month I was making a little bit more, not much, but a little bit. And it was definitely, it was definitely going up. And then because I did all of this work, uh, in person doing all of the, um, doing all the research, I had been speaking at fantasy conventions had been uh, a panelist and a demonstrator. So I've been demonstrating swordsmanship and hand to hand combat and, um, all the stuff con langing. I built an elvish language for my book because I thought that's what you did. So, you know, I was on panels on fantasy languages and things. And so I was at uh, Norwest Con in Seattle, and then about six months after the book came out, and I took that month's promo money and used it to buy hard copies of the book. And I took a big box of books, maybe two, I think it was two boxes of books, um, to the consignment table and went and did my thing. Because people had been asking me if I was ever going to write a book, and I hadn't told them I was working on one. And this time I went and had my book, and I put it in front of me at every single panel. and my, I went out, I went for my autograph signing, uh, and I, I figured that my autograph signing was going to be an opportunity for me to, uh, like catch up. Cause I, I, I had like 15 panels or something over the course of three days. It was crazy. And I thought it was to be a chance for me to rest. I actually was late getting to my signing cause I stopped and got a burger and took it with me because I'd have a chance to like eat and just be left alone for a little bit. And I got to my autograph signing and there was a line of people all the way out into the middle of the room. And I was signing autographs for the full hour. People, they had sold every single book uh, that I had brought and uh, the sales from that weekend pushed it up into the top 20 in military fantasy on Kindle. And there it found a whole new readership. And it turned out that there was this whole huge group of, um, of realism obsessed fantasy readers and they were convention goers and Norwest con is a really cool convention because it's, it's unique because it is a, it's not as much of a fan convention as it is a convention for content creators. So there were a lot of questions and a lot of hands on stuff. And it there was a, just a different kind of reader there and a different kind of fan. Um, and it, it, it just exploded after that. And then it started, I could see where it started to, to generate its own little spikes after that, as it was getting found by different groups of people and spread around through word of mouth. And then it just kind of took off, got some really great reviews. And then after that, I got the, those spikes and those reviews, I pushed the price up a little bit and then it went and I got an international book bub. And then a month or two after that, I got a U.S. book bub. Um, and then, and yeah, and then I just, I just kind of, just kind of did its thing after that. And at that point we pushed the price, I think we pushed the price up at that point to $4.99 or $5.99 and it just kept going. Um, we made friends with a publicist uh, that we'd met who worked with some major authors and he managed to get some traction at uh, mainstream fantasy sites and so I got some reviews and some plugs, um, and that was that was just awesome. And then it and it just kept going. I mean, it, uh, Publishers Weekly gave it a killer review right when we thought it was dropping off the face of the earth. 
Um, it got a fantastic review and publishes weekly and it just took off again. And then had another book, Bob, I think a year after the first one, another one last year. And then, and that's been it. And it's been selling steadily ever since I uh, do convention appearances. I speak at colleges, um, high schools. It just, yeah, I'm not, I'm not really sure what I did. One of the things that we did that we did differently though, is that we, after the first book, Bob, we decided that we were no longer going to spend money on non curated promotions. We were only going to go for promotions, only going to, to only going to attempt to get promotion promotions that you had to compete for. So you had to submit your stuff and it had to be reviewed. And so whether that was, whether that was book Bob or whether it was ENT or whether it was, um, uh, the early bird with Barnes and Noble or the portalist or even just promotional opportunities that you didn't necessarily pay for, but that you had to go and, and it, more or less earn, I guess. So like, like trying, like getting reviews at major fantasy sites and that sort of thing, we were going to put our effort toward that and put our promotional money toward, you know, a publicist who can push the book um, out into that mainstream and see if it could actually compete and it got out there and it could. And that, yeah. That makes a lot of sense yeah. because those places are going to have higher, I want to say reader confidence because like if you see if you see an ad that you just bid it on, then whatever, anybody can get an ad there. But people know that BookBub picks their stuff and people know that like there was a discerning mind behind this. So you start off with a higher bar of, of reader confidence. Um, yes, definitely. So you were talking about hardcover books and I noticed that you have hardcover yeah. books like your Amazon page has hardcover books uh, yes. with a pretty hefty price tag associated with them. So first I want to say like, obviously they're good for signing and stuff like that, but do you have any success with them just on general sales? To some degree, I actually out um, hardcovers outsell. There's another thing too, man. I, I, I threw down some coin and got a professional cover designer and she did a, just a phenomenal job i mean the actual hardcover itself is it, it's a work of art all the way through it is just absolutely gorgeous and the hardcovers outsell the paperbacks at my in-person events um i sell out of hardcovers almost every time and my hardcover sales are probably 30 percent more than than my uh paperbacks at in-person signings um and we also have on our website we have a store and we can sell directly from uh from the store we sell a lot of hardcovers that way as well and people want to want them inscribed so we you can you can order the book and then you can you can just email me with the receipt and let me know what you want uh written inside the book and i'll inscribe it exactly the way you want so we use them for that a lot too um the actual online sales of the of the hardcover i don't really i don't really see it and just we just don't um so uh, we did them through uh, we did them through uh, Ingram Spark. That's what I was going to ask. Did. I was wondering if they were print on demand or if you had a, a batch done. No, they're print on demand. Um, we have batches. We we have batches run, but they're small batches. It's all, it's all print on demand. Um, and we've got a couple of distributors that we work with who've gotten the book into libraries and that sort of thing. And we're in a lot of the catalogs. So the independent uh, we're with uh, IndieBound. Um, so independent bookstores can get it any place. You know, we sold enough through uh, Early Bird that we qualify for Barnes and Noble to carry the book if they choose to. So we're in the Barnes and Noble catalog as well. And sometimes people will order it at a Barnes and Noble, and sometimes they'll order two or three, and they'll they'll stay in a store or whatever. So nice. So looking back, is there anything different you did for your second release that you wish you would have done for your first? Oh God, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, also let's just go with top three then. <laughs> oh man. Okay. First thing, the first thing that I did with the second book was if you go to my Instagram, you'll see that I um I put out I did a social media blitz for about six months before the book released, and I put out um, you know, I had I I've got branded artwork and quotes from the book and this little funny snippets and you know, artwork uh, representative of scenes um, and all of that stuff. And also did, uh, I've got, I have a Pinterest page as well that has the, um, like the, the world building, what do they call it? The, the atmospherics, right? So you can see this is the, there's the inspiration for this guy's sword. And this is the kind of armor that they use here. And 
this is the person that I use. This is a picture I used for, for the inspiration for this character and all of these kinds of things. So all of that was there. So there was a chance to build that hype. And then of course, for the first book, I didn't have anybody to really push it to. If I'd really done it right, if I'd been really smart, I would have taken a couple of years while I was finishing the first book and, and doing that, that, that last edit and while I was going through its editing and all of that. And when I was, when I was at, that fantasy convention for the couple of years before that, I would have been, I would have been building a mailing list. That's the thing that I should have done more than anything else. Cause my mailing list the second time around was just incredible. And I've got, I think I have maybe 500 names on my mailing list. It's not big, but my open rate is fantastic. And we sold a just God. Yeah. The, the people on the mailing list, we could see, we, uh, we, we set up a thing with them where if they bought the book, they could send us the receipt and we'd send them an arc, uh, an uncorrected arc. And we uh, did that through book funnel. So didn't have to worry about anybody pirating it. And, uh, and that worked out wonderfully. And we, and the, 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 man, we just, Oh my God, it just did great. And so it launched with a whole bunch of reviews on Goodreads right off the bat. Um, yeah, I, I would have been a lot more, proactive. I guess those, those are really the two things I would have done a much longer, not necessarily put it out for pre-release, but I would have done a much longer social media push, um, and really gotten the branding out there. And I also would have worked the mailing list a lot more. So I, I screwed both of those up. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't even know those were things when I launched the first one. So. Well, that's typical of most authors. We're kind of stumbling through our, our first book, like, Oh, we publish it. How do we sell it? Um, are yeah. you just, Doing the mailing list through the convention, or do you also have like a sign up in the back of the book now? I um, I have a sign up on my website, and we have a get into arguments with people over this, but our sign up uh, nag screen pops up when you scroll down almost to the end of the website. No sooner. So if somebody gets that far, then I figure that they actually want more information and that's when it comes up and that's been tremendously successful for us. That's worked really well. Um, I think it's probably the least obtrusive way to do that. But the big thing with the marketing too, and I, I should have touched on this earlier, is that with the exception of like AMS ads or brand specific ads, like um, the brand specific marketing, like um, um, like Early Bird, which is Barnes and Noble, right? Um, almost everything that, 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 we put out there links to the website. It doesn't link to Amazon. So if I do a guest blog post someplace, if I am doing an interview someplace, if I, when I put a table card out at an independent bookstore and it's got a QR code on it, it doesn't go to the Amazon page. It doesn't go to the Barnes and Noble page. It goes directly to my website. And one of the reasons for that is that the reason that Amazon only takes 30% of your money is because the analytics are where the real value is. And once you have, once you have that, when you, you can see where they came from, you can see exactly how they got there. You see what they looked at. You see how long they stayed on your site. You can even, I mean, you can see what retailer they went to and you can track your sales right down to the click and you know what's working and what doesn't, you know, what kind of blog posts work. And if I do a blog post, if I do a guest blog post on this, then these blog posts on my site are going to light up. And after X number of these, and that's when somebody really goes. And using the, because our original idea on this was to try to launch not just the book, but the series as an experience and as a new kind of widget or app or something and use that kind of marketing instead of marketing it like a, uh, like just like another book. And the idea was to, I mean, because like if I'm going to go and buy something, right, if I'm going to go and buy, I don't know, a new pair of hiking boots or something, right? I'm going to go to the manufacturer's website. I'm going to look at it. I'm going to want the picture of the boot that I can turn around and I'm going to want to see video of it. And I'm going to want to take a look at this new lacing system that they have. And I'm going to want to read testimonials. I'm going to want to do all of that before I go to the store. On the website, the website will tell me the closest store to me where I can get it. That's what we did with this. This is a new kind of book. You know, it's a fantasy techno thriller. To our knowledge, nobody has done this before. Here's what we're doing. And we use the website to build the brand and the buzz. And then we use that to turn people loose. Um, and then when they exit the website, then we send them to their choice of retailer. You can go to Kobo, you can go to Barnes and Noble, you can go to Amazon, wherever. 
and then we keep our analytics and something that works, <laughs> works really well because you, you can see immediately what works and what doesn't and there's no more guesswork. And when sales start to flag, you go back and look at something that worked before. Hey, we haven't done that in a while. That worked pretty well. Let's do that again. Okay, bang. And you get them you, and it, you can, to some degree, you can recreate some of your sales spikes and some of that, um, so some of that, some of those little rushes. So that's the other thing too, is that if you just, if you just, if you're only on Amazon, um, I don't, I don't know how you would do it without having, without having the data. I just, I don't know how you would. So that's, that's been our big ace in the hole, I guess. Um, yeah, I would say that people who are just uh, exclusive to Amazon could still do what you're doing, directing to their website first, or like, I'll use the books to read yes. uh, by draft to digital and that gives you information too on the click before sure. sending them to the sites. So it's, it's Absolutely. a great idea and you're, you're totally right. Like, otherwise you have no idea how many clicks did you get or how many books did you buy based off that one thing you did? Who knows? You know, and it's, it's a conspiracy theory out there that we may be selling far more books than Amazon tells us we are. There's no way for us to know. Realistically, we it only have their just, word. Right. Depending on what yeah. they tell us. And sold, all the sites. Oh yeah. I could have sold 20,000 books. I'll never know. I will simply never know. I don't think they're doing that. I don't think Amazon's doing that. I really don't. I don't, I don't think that's what's happening, but it's just terrifying to think that that could be happening and you wouldn't know about it. That's, that's really scary in this age where, I mean, you know, business intelligence is a thing and I'm an intelligence analyst. So, I mean, business intelligence is, this is, this is how the world works right now. And all these authors are out there with no intelligence, nothing, not that they're not being intelligent, but no intelligence, no actual, you know, analytics, no data, no, uh, yeah, that's that. Whew, yeah. Um, I wish I'd done that sooner. So we did that, that coincided with, with the big push from NorwestCon when we had that big sales push, then it was time to completely revamp the website and go and do it that way. And we had originally talked about doing it this way. Um, and we got, we got talked out of it, which again, at the time made sense as a fledgling author, it wouldn't have made too much sense to do it that way. And I decided to do what everybody else did. I mean, hell, I was in Kindle Unlimited for the first 90 days. Um, and the same way that everybody else did. And I'm, I'm, I, yeah, I'm surprised I survived. So, yeah. Um, I am curious. You mentioned early bird at Barnes and Noble, and I don't think anybody we've had anybody on to talk about that before. What is that exactly, and how did you get involved? I don't, um, early bird is a it's a promotion that Barnes and Noble does. They send out a newsletter. Um, it's very much like BookBub, except it goes out to Barnes and Noble customers. Um, and again, it's it's competitive. It's curated. The big five. Um, the big five publishers gun for it as well. And you put your book out there and um, sometimes it gets picked up and sometimes it doesn't usually it doesn't. Um, but it's, it's fairly expensive, but it's Barnes and it's one of, one of the ways that Barnes and Noble gets word out about the next big thing. And so it puts the book directly in front of Barnes and Noble customers. So it's, I don't even know if they're doing that anymore. Um, we haven't used it in a while. Um, we really got, we got the sales that we needed off of Barnes and Noble and then, oh man. Barnes and Noble has been having an interesting trajectory of late. <laughs> yeah, they really have. And the thing is this, man, and I, I know we're coming up on, on, on the hour on this. Maybe you guys want to cut some of this stuff out because there's a thing that, that they're doing and they're not alone in this, but the big box stores and, you know, they, they'll <laughs> – Man, we, we we just had a thing with Barnes and Noble. I did a I, I did an author signing at Barnes and Noble, uh, an author event, and they bought I don't know thirty fifty of my books for the event. I'm like, dude, you're never gonna sell those, and they sure as hell didn't. You know, they sold a handful, and then I had to pay for all the other ones coming back. I had to give them their money back, and then I had to pay my shipping. I had to pay their shipping on top of it, and I mean, I ended up eating you know, a few hundred bucks on this thing. And I'm getting pissed off about it because nobody does this. This is a business model that dates back to the Great Depression. It is so in stupid that they still do this because independent bookstores don't do this. We don't have this problem for independent bookstores. The only time I ever get a box of books returned to me, um, you know, and have to give them their money back, that only happens with like Barnes and Noble. Um, 
Yeah. So uh, I got contacted by Costco asking if uh, we wanted to do a run of like, I don't even know, it's like 10,000 books for Costco. And I was like, oh God, no. You don't have to mortgage my house to gamble yeah. on that one because they'd send them all back. I mean, yeah. what's what they probably rip the front covers off and then send it back and charge me shipping. Um, I don't understand. I mean, the whole model is broken and yeah, I don't know. There's okay, a ranto. <laughs> there's a checkbox uh, in Ingram Spark that's like allow returns and people, that's a terrifying checkbox when you have to figure out whether it or not is. you want to market. <laughs> it is. And there are still, there are still retailers who will not, even retailers who order from print on demand who, who, do, who do just in time inventory. Uh, some of them will not accept your book if you don't allow returns. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right. So I got, I have a question about like you have a hardcover, which many people don't have, but it looks like you don't have audio books. Is that right? I do not. I do not. Uh, my agent is currently negotiating the audio rights. That was, that was a short question then. I was just going to ask if it was a conscious decision to do it. And if you had any plans to do so, I got 10,000 books out there, man. Somebody is going to, yeah, I'm going to, yeah, that's basically that. That's where I'm, that's, that's where I'm going with it. So it's going to be a nice second yeah. bite of the apple for those books. Once it, once you get the audio, that's, that's kind of what I'm thinking. Yeah. So that's, yeah, that's, that's, I don't know. I could be wrong. Okay, Joe. So when you're getting ready to release your third novel, when you, whenever that happens to be, do you ever, do you have any plans to re reduce the prices of your, your first two, maybe in an attempt to draw more readers in or? Absolutely not. That? Nope. Nope. Uh uh nope nope I'm selling at five ninety nine um unless I get like another book bub or something um I'm not I'm not going to drop my price except for a, the occasional promotion uh just no nope I mean my book still costs less than a, than a well drink at happy hour um that's I don't, a good way to look at it <laughs> come on no absolutely not uh. Nope, I have no interest in dropping the price of my books. So, nope. You mentioned that the, the convention was very helpful for you to get the ball rolling. Do you have any recommendations yes. for authors who maybe haven't tried a convention yet or tried it but didn't sell any books? Uh, it sounds like by doing all the panels, you have this expertise that you were kind of able to leverage. But any advice that's for maybe those who don't have that? Sure. Yeah, that's a big piece of it. Um, we did a convention just recently where we set up a table. I wasn't on any panels. We set up a table to see what would happen, and we just flopped. It just it didn't even pay for itself. Um, so I think it has to do with the – I think it may be idiosyncratic to the way that I do things and the market that I'm going after. I think that there's an element of my readership who might be interested in not only in the book, but in an, but in a book by an author who has some kind of street cred, so to speak. Um, they want to see me up there doing the thing and that's what gets them to, to buy the book. I don't know that that would work for, for other authors. Again, I think it's, I think it's really brand specific to me and that's, then the branding is a big part of it for me too. At the, at these conventions, I've got a, I think we talked with us on keyboards, but I, I have a specific look that I have at conventions. I generally wear a suit, uh, no tie, but I wear, or, or a sport jacket, um, with a great big, you know, two handed sword on my shoulder. Um, and it, there's, there's just a look, you know, I've got that, I've got, we've got the military haircut and, and the, the, the kind of James Bond suit and the big Highlander sword. And people immediately, if they saw me at a convention two years ago, they're like, Hey, that's the guy, that's the sword guy. And they, I've, I've, so, Again, it's all part of the branding, you know. And so, for me doing the, for me doing the panels and especially doing the demonstrations, the hands-on stuff, the live stuff, that for me is part of my branding. So that's that's part of what works for me as far as that goes. I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how you make it work sitting at a table selling things all day. I was also really uncomfortable there. I didn't like that at all. And I'm great on stage. I'm great in front of crowds. Again, I I write. I, I lecture for a living. Um, I, I, I was a musician, still am. I playing playing a band here in town, and uh, yeah. I but man, sitting at a table and waiting for people to walk up to you and then trying to sell them this thing that's in front of you to me that feels really alien and really weird. So I just I don't have that. Whatever it takes to do that, some people might, 
And if they do, then hey, man, go crazy if it works for you. But I, 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 I don't understand it. So it comes off yeah. as awkward and forced and weird. It does seem like you would be. Get, I can see why you would get more mileage uh, after doing some panels and being recognized. And and I guess other people would have other expertise that they could maybe draw on. Absolutely. I know there's some uh, science fiction or science podcasts I listen to, and if those guys oh, have yeah. read a book, I'd buy it instantly just to support oh, them. Definitely, and, and it yeah. doesn't even have to be on something it doesn't even have to be on world building i mean it could be something on writing it could be something on marketing there are these panels all the time at, at conventions for 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 writers it could be anything that you have some kind of expertise on um and again it it, it works for me you know, there's the old joke about if you if you ask a porcupine how to solve your problem for you he'll tell you to stick it with quills so this is that this is what i'm doing so i don't know it works for me i guess yeah oh. absolutely um, all right, so I have one more question. Uh, yeah. So you've got this this long re release cycle. Um, do you, well, in this, you've released a second book. Are you doing, when you do promote, are you promoting the second book or are you getting, uh, uh, funneling people back to book one? I'm doing both. I'm running AMS ads right now for both equally. Um, we've, we've dropped off the promotion for the second book because it seems to be doing pretty well right now. It's riding a pretty good wave on its own. And I don't, I'm not, I wasn't seeing the returns from it. Um, we did one price promotion with, I forget. Oh God, I forget what we did. We did one price promotion. Where we dropped it to 99 cents for a couple of days. Um, and it did spectacularly. It was great. Gave it, gave it legs for another few weeks. Um, and we're seeing some strange numbers with the AMS ads right now. And I think what's going on with it, I think, because the we're running ads that are almost identical for both books. I mean, the exact same wording for both books, right? And targeting the same keywords and everything all the way down. And we're seeing the ACOS on one ad for Dragon's Trail down around, in one case, we've got it probably under 25% on a given day. It's just awesome. And then for the new Magic, the sequel, same ad, we're seeing uh, the ACOS on that. I think right now it's like 150%. It's insane. But I think what's going on, when we look at it, we're still selling more of the first book than we are the second one. And when we promote the second book, people buy the first one first, then they go back and buy the second one. And then we see that we see the 150% come down um, slowly as this is going on. So I think what's going on is that they're, they see the ad for the second book, say, oh, it's a sequel. Then they go and they grab the first one, they read it, then they buy the second one, and then that's when it shows up um, on the AMS ads. It's going to be a couple of weeks or a month or something later. We're seeing the numbers finally start to normalize, but I'm fairly sure that we're still selling more of the first book initially than the second one. And I wrote the second one as a standalone. I wrote it as its own entry point into the series, uh, the way that fantasy or the way that, that uh, thriller authors do. You don't have to read the Hunt for Red October to read the Cardinal of the Kremlin. Um, you, can, you can read them in any order and you just, one of one references things that happened in the other one and that's all fine. And that's what I did with this. Even though the story starts a month later, um, every book in the series is gonna be its own entry point. So there's, they don't have to be read in order. I even say that in the, in the Amazon page for you. You don't have to read this book second, but people are doing it anyway. So that's what they do. Okay. So of all the marketing and advertising you've done, have there been any yeah. surprise results? For example, these ads were great, but these ones sucked rocks. I mean, have you, have you noticed anything like that? Yeah, actually. Um, Let me think about this for just a second, because that that oh god, we've just we have done so much. Um, I think I, the most the thing that really gets me on all of it is uh, what I was just talking about, where we're putting out ads for the second book, and those ads appear to be selling the first one. Um, so that's that, and that's again, that's that's, that's skewing the numbers quite a bit. Um, some of the things that worked trying to think of what worked really well you know there was something actually we got a we got a review in a uh say because my, my 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 wife is my i'm so lucky because my wife is a uh she's a marketing consultant for it firms this is all her idea um she's the brands of the outfit all i do is lift heavy things and get stuff down from shelves i don't that's that's my whole thing um nice but, to see someone else has my same role so yeah 
that's that's it, man. Jack not named Jack Job, um, but uh, <laughs> but um, we uh, we got a we got a we got a review in a fantasy website in. Oh, I'm gonna screw this up. I think it's in Finland. God, I hope it's in Finland because they're gonna get mad if it's not. Anyway, and. I thought it was really nice. They gave it this great, really awesome in-depth review. They gave Dragon's Trail this fantastic review, and and the book exploded across like northern Europe and in the UK. It just blew up, and I had no idea that there was that size of a fantasy readership uh, in northern Europe. It just didn't cross my mind. It makes perfect sense, mind you, uh, and. Uh, you know, I've been to Sweden. I've been to Iceland. I've been I've been all over Europe, and and in in the in Northern Europe, everybody speaks English, uh, and it just didn't cross my mind that there was that huge of a market there. So we've been, uh, yeah, that was that was really neat. That was really eye opening. That's when it really started to hit me just how big this thing might actually get. Watching those numbers go up, um, it's when I realized that there was a yeah, there, there's always another market out there that, that you can that you can find. And so it's not a matter so much of writing to market as marketing to the market, I think. So, yeah. Very wise words. And I, I think a lot of people have done blog yeah. tours and found they're often not that great because a lot of the blogs on it don't have any traffic. But there are certainly some review sites out there that have been going for like 10, 15 years and really have a big they're following. Not. So if you can get and it. never. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, if you can, it's fantastic. My God. I, yeah, it was, man, it was, it was awesome. And uh, my wife has relatives in Sweden and she was actually on a TV show in Sweden. It's a long story. Um, but uh, she has, she has all these relatives in Sweden. They're like, Oh, we saw your book. Oh, we saw your book. And uh, so, okay. All right. Um, fantastic. You know, yeah. It's just, uh, yeah, it's, it's, all right. Well, thank you thank very together. much. We've been talking for about an hour, so we better let you go. And uh, hopefully, uh, I think people will enjoy this because you've been doing some things that not everybody is doing. And it's, you know, I, I say this often, it's great to hear people having success, not just like, oh, rapid release into Kindle Unlimited. And, you know, there are hey, many roads. <laughs> if you can do that and you can make it work, more power to you. Um, you know, I, I just to wrap this up, I mean, I was, you know, I was on, I wrote, the new magic when I was on back-to-back -back tours uh, uh, in the army. I'm, I'm in the army reserve and I just came off of two active duty tours. And I'm just starting another one. Um, so, I mean, I was taking, you know, I was, <laughs> I was, I was using my leave to go to these conventions and go to do author events. Um, and I, I, I couldn't write fast. There's just no way I could. I also have a terrible process that I talk about on my blog. You can look it up. Um, but I just, I, I, I don't have the ability to do that. And for people who do, man, that's great. And again, the thing that I'm doing, it might not work for everybody, but maybe there's something in all of this that somebody can use someplace. Maybe it'll spark something. Maybe it'll help somebody. Um, I would not, standard disclaimer, I don't, <laughs> I, I'm not saying go out and go mountaineering. I'm not saying go out and jump on a horse to see what it feels like to get bucked off. I'm not saying to go out and do these things and put yourself in any kind of physical jeopardy. And I'm also not going to sit here and tell you that the way that I did this is the way that's going to work for everybody. Um, I really do think that it's, that it's, it's specific to, to, to the model that I've built, but I don't know. I hope it helps somebody. You mean don't try this at home. <laughs> that yes, I do all my own stunts as the man says. Yes. So, yeah. you well, guys I'm sure there great. are folks out there that do enjoy doing all those things and that they will like, you know, connect with what you've been saying. So I, we really appreciate you talking to us for the last hour. Absolutely. Um, remind I'm folks glad. where they can find you. And uh, you've sure. mentioned your books, but go ahead and shoot them out again. Yeah, you bet. Uh, my books are Dragon's Trail and The New Magic. And you can find me at josephmalik.com, J-O-S-E-P-H-M-A-L-I-K.com. And yeah, and Lindsay, Jeff, Joseph, you guys have been great. This has been fantastic. Thank you. Well, thanks for hanging out with Thank us. We you. appreciate it. Pleasure is mine. This is uh, episode 204, guys. So if you miss any of the links there, just come by the site, marketingsff.com, and we'll have the links in the show notes for you. 
Uh, thank you, awesome. Joe, and thank you, everyone, for listening. Have a good one. Thanks a lot. So you too, everybody. Bye.